Welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And my name is John Osana. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Adaptation Science Center. And today's webinar is titled Connectivity for Climate Change, Assessing Threats and Identifying Conservation Actions for Three Wildlife Species in the Southeast United States. And we're excited to have Jen Costanza from North Carolina State University with us today. So let's get started and to, uh, to uh, introduce Jen Costanza, we have Sean Carter with USGS who will be introducing her. Uh, Sean, take it over. Thanks, John. Well, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Jen Costanza today to be our speaker. Um, Dr. Costanza is a research assistant professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State. Her research seeks to better understand recent and potential future threats to ecosystems and landscapes. The threats she studies include direct and indirect effects of climate change, land use, and altered disturbance regimes. She uses simulation models to project future landscape change, in addition to a variety of quantitative and qualitative methods for her research. She works to produce a body of knowledge that can be used by natural resource and conservation practitioners and to make better management and policy decisions. And uh, I've had the privilege of working uh, with Jen in the past, and it's a privilege to have her speak with her today about some of her work. So Jen, welcome, and uh, please take it away. All right, thanks. Um, I hope you all can hear me. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Sean, and thanks, for, thanks to Elda and uh, John for um, inviting me and getting this set up. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna talk about um, some work we've done um, on connectivity uh, in the southeast and specifically for, with climate change in mind um, and even more specifically thinking about once we have identified a connectivity network um, for species, uh, what do we do? How do we figure out what to do um, for climate change with that network? Um, so. But first, I want to take a quick step back and thank my collaborators. So this is part of a sort of bigger project or multi-part project that was, that's was that been funded or had some funding from the Southeast um, Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and it involves a number of collaborators um, at NC State and beyond. Um, and here they are. So they've done bits and pieces of this. And, the, um, and, and uh, so it's been a really fun team to work with. And so, um, we're talking about connectivity. Many of you all participating on this webinar uh, may have heard a lot about connectivity or may not have, um, but uh, the idea has kind of has gained traction um, in the recent past, especially with climate change in mind. And this, this paper from 2009, so it's almost 10 years ago now, but it really underscores um, that point. Uh, this review by Heller and Zavaleta um, cited that increasing connectivity was the most frequently proposed management strategy in the literature. So they reviewed the literature and found that this was kind of the number one strategy for management um, of wildlife and biodiversity um, for climate change. Um, and so being 10 years ago, that kind of helped thrust connectivity in, into kind of the limelight um, over the last several years um, and folks working on connectivity uh, with climate change in mind and as a kind of climate change adaptation strategy. And so kind of in my mind, those studies um, that have aimed to map and plan for connectivity have kind of taken one of at least two different directions. Maybe there's more directions than this, but um, on the left, uh, some studies, and I have a problem with my titles on this slide, but um, the study by Nunez et al. Um, in conservation biology is um, one example of the types of studies that have looked at connectivity of climate itself. Um, so this study looked at how can we connect um, gradients of temperature um, and, or in, in other cases there's other climate variables, but how can we make connections with climate explicitly in mind um, because we think that species need, will need to move and, and migrate to, um, to, to track changing climate. Um, and then the other set of studies sort of illustrated on the, with the right two pictures here on the screen, um, really have in mind the fact that connectivity in and of itself is important um, because a network of connected habitat can support large genetically diverse populations. 
um, and that can enhance the capacity of species to adapt to a number of changes, including climate change. So connectivity kind of in, in and of itself um, is important for robust um, populations and species. Um, and um, our study has kind of taken the, the latter tact in that we were identifying some existing connectivity networks, um, but we then wanted to kind of think about um, what do we do with these, once we've identified these connectivity networks for a species, what do we do um, for climate change? Uh, and so, let's see. Next slide, yeah. So, um, so our study focused, our broader study focused on connectivity, mapping and modeling connectivity for three species in the southeast. Um, they're identified as priority species and, and we co consulted with biologists and experts from the landscape conservation cooperatives in the region and others. Um, and so all three of these species use bottomland hardwood habitat to some extent, but they vary in the degree to which they're specialists or generalists and the kind of home range or habitat um, sizes that they use. So the snake here is a timber rattlesnake. I'll refer to it just as a snake, um, but uh, it's, it's got perhaps the smallest home range and it has kind of smaller movements and dispersal distances um, and it's a somewhat a specialist but will use some upland habitats in, in, um, in addition to, to bottomland habitats, bottomland hardwood habitats. Uh, the bat here is Raffinesque's big-eared bat. Uh, it has a, a little bit larger home range and dispersal um, distance and it's um, probably the most specialist in bottomland hardwoods throughout the region. Uh, and then the bear is the black bear. Um, it has a, sort of the, the largest home range um, and dispersal um, distances. Uh, and it's the most generalist species. It'll use um, you know, just general forest cover, even some ag lands sometimes. Um, and so those are the three species um, we were working with. And I'll just mention too that this broader goal was of our team was to model and map how landscapes can be connected across the region for those three species. Um, and then we sought to look at the priority actions, those priority conservation actions for um, conserving those, those linkages under climate change. So our prior work um, focused quite a bit, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of it here, but it focused quite a bit about sort of the technical aspects of how to map connectivity and we used a number of different tools um, and, and input data to do that. And, um, and we have, and my collaborators have um, some nice work on that. But so again, but for this talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to really talk about what, once we have those the maps of those linkages, what do we do with them for climate change? Um, and so this slide is just an overview of where we started from with the connectivity mapping. So uh, sort of the a common approach with mapping connectivity networks is to um, uh, input some kind of surface or, or data related to the resistance of the environment to movement. Um, and in, in our case, uh, we used, we mapped habitat suitability based on climate and land use, land cover, um, and then took the inverse of it to, to construct our resistance surface. Um, we used just briefly, an ensemble of niche models, environmental niche models, um, and climate data um, from 30 years in the recent past from the PRISM data set. Um, and then we identified habitat note, and we did this for every species. I'm showing black bear, but we did this for all three species. Um, then we identified habitat nodes, um, which were the top um, third of, of grid cells in terms of their, their being the highest suitability in the, in the region. Um, and then we selected from those top third, we selected patches, um, cells that made up patches that were at least 20 times the mean female home range size for the species. So we wanted big patches of suitable habitat for nodes. Um, and then uh, we, and the results, the work I'm showing now, we, as, as a result of the, we used um, linkage mapper software to map um, least cost paths between pairs of those nodes um, in the landscape. And then we buffered them um, to five kilometers. And that, those are, that's the example map you're seeing here for the black bear. Um, okay, yeah, so, and then this is just what those looked like for all three species. Um, 
So that's where we are starting from with uh, maps of linkages. But again, um, we kind of wanted to then think about what, once we have this map of linkages that's based on the current habitat, current climate, what do we do um, for climate change? And, and so for us, we, we started with looking at the literature. Um, the way we started thinking about this came kind of firstly from the idea of climate refugia. Um, and this is a picture from um, Morelli et al. and PLOS One a couple years ago. Um, and so, firstly, what we do for, for climate change with these linkages depends on their threat. And so, um, the climate change refugia literature um, kind of points out that refugia are areas where suitable climatic conditions will persist, um, despite, even though there's changes at regional and global scales, um, there are places that locally in the landscape that um, where suitable habitat will persist. Um, and so in those places, um, or in our cases, in, in the linkages that might be more stable over time in terms of their suitable habitat, um, those might point to places where we can, we don't have to consider climate change as a threat, but we need to manage other non-climate threats um, as a priority in those. Um, so this is kind of the first cut. And then, and then in converse, places, the linkages that would, um, would change a lot or where the climate threat is high, where suitability might um, decrease uh, a lot over time, or be expected to decrease over time, um, might be places that require adaptation. And here's just one example of a picture um, uh, uh, related to population migration, assisted migration um, within an existing population. They might think about um, movement of the linkage or movement of the population to different places. But again, you might, um, places where you'd want to do that, you'd want to know, in this case, what the condition is of the surrounding landscape. Um, and again, that points to non-climate stressors. Um, even though you're concerned about climate change, there might, might be other non-climate stressors um, that you might want to take into account if you're going to think about moving a linkage um, or moving uh, species habitat or ex establishing um, a population in a different place. Um, and so thinking about that dichotomy between climate change refugia and places that need adaptation um, kind of led us to a relatively simple framework that I'm going to show you um, that we applied for the R3 species. Um, again, it's the degree of climate change threat plus non-climate stressors. And in this case, um, we focused on land, the expected degree of land use change and the level of protection for conservation or conservation management. Um, so, and we focused um, on land use change in particular, especially in the southeast. Um, growth of urban areas has been shown to be one of the key um, drivers of change in land use um, in the future, uh, or the key types of land use we'll see in the future. Um, and also land use and climate change can have interacting effects, so that's important to, um, so yeah, land use change is important to think about. Uh, and then finally, the final bullet there is that we also thought about some, we need to take into account the importance of each linkage to the overall network because um, if a, even if a linkage is severely threatened by climate change, um, if it's not important, not as important to the overall habitat network or to the species, um, population and the resilience of the species, then it may not be worth focusing on. So those are the things we, we thought about in developing this framework. And so uh, our framework, again, um, we're talking about linkages in, a, in an existing connectivity network. Uh, so we can think about climate change threat kind of from low to high or a dichotomy from low to high. And again, with low climate change threat, um, places of low threat sort of being places of refugia and high threat being places where adaptation is needed. Um, and so for those refugial linkages, we think about degree of land use change and degree of protection kind of on two axes that might lead to sort of a space in which we have a number of conservation priority actions that we might take. And here I'm just dividing low and high for each of those axes. You could divide it more, but we chose to keep it simple um, and thinking about um, 
the types of actions or priorities that you might think about. And so these are just examples of, of things that might be priorities and the linkages based on their low climate change threat and then based on their uh, degree of protection and degree of land use change. Um, so for example, if the degree of land use change is high and the existing protection for conservation is low, which is that darkest blue, then adding protection might be a priority if you think about trying to add protection before land use change um, uh, becomes an issue or before it um, becomes as drastic. Um, or if land use change in the future was expected to be low, um, that might be all right and the priority might be to work with individual landowners and in this case I'm, I'm have written private lands or private landowners but I really mean sort of individual non-conservation landowners um, and so those are some of the things we talked about where we thought about for refugia and then places that need adaptation um, you could divide up the same axes and these are higher climate threat, um, but you have some parallel here. Um, sort of this is a typology of priority actions for the linkages that need adaptation. And these focus around moving protected areas or moving corridors within a protected area. Um, and in an extreme case of high climate threat and high land use, high anticipated land use change and low protection, maybe it's worth moving populations to more con a more connected portion of their range. And again, you know, these are just suggestions, um, but sort of a first cut of how to think about and prioritize some actions. Um, and and also again, we're ta we're talking we're assuming that the most important linkages have been identified um, in each network. And so this is kind of how we we apply this framework to our three focal species. Um, we calculated the degree of climate change threat um, by the middle of the 21st century for all linkages and then narrowed it down to the most important linkages in the network and used those um, three or the, the two additional criteria, the land use change, um, degree of land use change expected and the degree of protection um, to, to kind of help determine the conservation priorities. And then what we did some work to uh, look at the geographic patterns and how those um, align among species. So I'll show you those. So, um, so I already showed how we use um, some environmental niche models to develop a suitability or resistance surface for the original connectivity network. So to, to calculate our index of climate change threat, we looked at the, the change in suitability. So we did the same thing, the same modeling approach, for, but for future climate, and we used um, Again, an ensemble of niche modeling and also an ensemble of um, future climate projections um, for the A2 scenario, which is a relatively high emission scenario. Um, we didn't change land cover here, um, so it's using existing land cover, um, but it's using future climate. Um, so, and, that, and I want to emphasize here, so our climate change threat here is a measure of um, not just the absolute change in climate, but it's on a relative basis to the species. So it's relative to ha habitat suitability. So if you're familiar with a vulnerability framework, it's not just the climate change exposure, but it's also the sensitivity of the species to that change or the species habitat to that change. Um, so then we overlaid our linkages and we calculated um, a mean value, average value of all the pixels falling in each linkage. Um, and then we also compared it to a regional average, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so here's the distribution. Here is a box, box plot by species. So this is just showing the distribution for all linkages for each species, the percent change in suitability. So the dark black bar in the middle of that box, each box is the average change um, across all of the linkages for the species. Uh, and then that box, the high and low end of that rectangular box um, is the 25th and 75th percentiles, and then the kind of whiskers um, represent sort of more of the tails of the range. Um, and so this points out that for all species on average, the suitability decreased, and within this is within all the linkages. Um, so the, the suitability decreased 
um, the bat had the saw the most decrease, about 32% decrease in suitability on average in the linkages. Bear, the bear was um, had the least decrease, about 15%, and then the snake kind of was in between at 23. Um, but what I think is actually more interesting, um, so in order to divide up our linkages um, into that dichotomy of a low and a high threat and, and really to relate this to a climate refugia idea, um, we wanted to look at linkages that had less, um, that were, that were more stable in climate and more stable in their suitability in this case um, than the surrounding landscape. And so we took the region-wide average, so all pixels in the, in the region, um, and, and and compared our each linkage to that average by species. So interestingly, um, the bat, so the bat did worse in terms of overall decrease in suitability um, and also um, does the worst compared to its regional average, um, which was about 11%. So on average, the linkages had about three times worse, you know, worse change in suitability um, compared to the landscape as a whole. Um, the snake actually, um, the snake actually had a moderate decrease on average in its linkages, but actually did better than its regional average of 28%. So the snake's linkages had 23% decrease, and the region-wide average was slightly worse than that. Um, so if we um, look on average for the snake, linkages on average were climate refugia, if we're defining them as doing better than the regional average um, of change. At least they have a somewhat lower threat in, of climate. Um, and when we look at a map, we can look at, we can divide up the linkages again based on sort of the larger decrease or below the region average um, or a smaller decrease or, or any increase um, in, their, in their suitability. And we look across all three species, we can see again, there are many more linkages for the snake that are blue. That means there were relative refugia or did better than the region average. Um, and for the bat especially and, and somewhat for the bear, there were quite a few um, that had a large decrease in suitability. So we're still talking about all linkages. Now um, I'm going to show how we put all these things together um, to to get toward the, that framework to be applied. And so first we wanted to prioritize important linkages and there are a number of ways we could have done this. We chose to use a graph theory metric called the Change in Integral in Index of Connectivity or DIIC, um, which basically measures um, the change in the total habitat's connectivity uh, or the total network's connectivity uh, with each linkage being removed. And we defined, we selected linkages that themselves were important based on that metric um, or that connected to the top 10% of important nodes. And so we defined the, we, we uh, selected the ten, top 10% 10 of important nodes with that same criterion. Um, so if the linkage was important or connected to one of those important nodes, we called it important in our network. And then we also overlaid for our, land, for our metric of land use change, um, we overlaid projected urbanization in the southeast, and this, again, is one of the biggest um, types of land use change in the region, um, and we felt it was very important to include. Um, and we are defining, we needed the threshold of low versus high in our, in our framework um, of low versus high land use change, and so we defined um, uh, lower than average uh, urbanization rate by the middle of the 21st century as being um, lower than the regional average for the study area, which was 139% um, increase. So if it, if it had less than 139% increase across the linkage, then it was lower, um, a low rate of urbanization with that, in that linkage. And similarly, for protected areas, we want to know the degree of protection or proportion of each linkage that was protected. And regionally, about 10% of the, of the region is, is under some conservation protection. Um, and so uh, a measure high, higher than that had a high level of protection and lower had a low level of protection. 
Um, and so putting that all together, we can start looking at this. So we, once we whittle it down to just the most important linkages, which I'll show map in a bit, um, we can start looking at low versus high climate change threat. And so these are, uh, for each species, each pair of bars is a species, and the low, the low and high are low climate change threat, lower than the, um, than the average for the species and higher. And so again, kind of in parallel with that, bar, that uh, box plot that I showed earlier, um, the bat and the bear had um, many more linkages. This is the proportion of, of the important linkages. Many more linkages that had high climate threat versus low, and the snake actually had the reverse. It had more linkages that were important that had a low climate change threat. Um, and then dividing that up further by the other two metrics, the other two metrics of land use change and protection, level of protection. Um, you see in the legend below, um, these are the same bars as the last figure, but just broken down now into, for, for low and high climate change, what were the, what were the other metrics? And so, um, again, the snake had more, Linkages, important linkages with uh, that were climate change refugia or with low climate change threat, but those also tended to have a pretty high rate of other stressors combined, um, which is that darker black. So higher land use and lower protection. Um, the bat and the bear, the bat in particular had a high had a high proportion of, of linkages with that high climate change threat, and they also are this, that dark color, which is both stressors are, are um, high, the high land use and low level of protection. Uh, and so we can map those um, for the three species for their important linkages. And again, these are maps um, with the linkages colored according to that earlier figure I showed with the reds and the blues. And so I'm putting it there for your convenience. Um, and again, not surprisingly, the snake, like we saw in the other uh, results has a lot of those blues, so a lot of the um, low climate change threat, um, and a lot of them are the darkest blue, which is the, which is, you might want to add protection. You're gonna, you might see a high degree of land use change in those linkages, um, and they have a low degree of protection. And the bear actually had the fewest. It has the fewest linkages overall, but it also had the fewest linkages that were important to the network. Um, and most of those are one of the red colors. Um, and the bat also had mostly red with a few, a few of the blues with low climate change threat there. Um, the next thing we did was to kind of put this into more of a common currency across the three species, uh, and also just for visualization purposes. Um, we overlaid the Omernix uh, level three ecoregions and uh, the ecoregions here that are not colored, that are white, uh, did not have any linkages or, or very little area of linkage, linkages that fell within them, or important linkages, I should say. Um, but we overlaid the, the ecoregions on the li important linkages, and these are the, basically the predominant category that came out in terms of the, the largest area um, of this connectivity network of the linkages that overlapped each ecoregion. And so you can see some similarities. Uh, again, just species by species, the snake has a lot more of those blues and purples, or blues and grays, excuse me. Uh, and especially in the north and the central regions, um, the bear has a few of those and the bat has fewer. But the, in terms of the kind of commonalities across species, um, those coastal plain ecoregions, there are two coastal plain ecoregions for which climate change threat was high. Land use, expected land use change would be high by middle of the century, and the degree of protection was low. Uh, and so, and that was, those were the only two that matched up across species. But this is just an example to show how we're applying this relatively simple framework here um, for the three species that we were, that we were mapping connectivity for. And so, um, just in summary, you know, I wanted to just show our, our framework, which is um, based on some simple concepts uh, about cl climate adaptation and climate refugia, 
um, and how we're thinking about it to inform some priorities or to start informing some priorities for conservation of connectivity um, and, and applying it to our three species. Uh, I just wanted to show that, that case study. It would be interesting to see it applied to other species and, and how, that, how those results might be similar or different. Um, and just for the species that we did look at, the combined threats from climate and land use change um, and low levels of protection were common. Uh, although they're using similar habitats, they differed in their, um, in their threats and conservation priorities, and especially um, when we look geographically. The, again, we saw the snake had a lot more of its linkages that were climate change refugia, and the bat and the bear had more linkages that needed adaptation measures. Um, and so, you know, this is just an example, and we had our thresholds that we used. We could change, you know, any of these and see how that might affect things, but, but it's just a starting point to, to kind of talk about some, some relatively simple metrics to, to inform conservation priorities. And I think the next step, a good next step would be um, selecting parcels and specific actions on those parcels and using some prioritization algorithms, maybe like Mark Sand, um, to dig into a, one or more key linkages and to prioritize, you know, conservation or acquisition of lands, and et cetera. Um, so with that, uh, that's the end of my talk, and I appreciate you all um, listening. I'm, I'd be happy to ask, um, to answer questions if you have them. Thanks. Thank you, Jen, uh, for your presentation. Um, and as she mentioned, if you have any questions regarding the presentation, uh, feel free to throw them into the chat box. And then there's also the Q&A box. Um, if you want to throw them into either of those boxes, I'll see them, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully get you an answer. Oh, bam, got one right now. Uh, can you expand on the natural history of the species to explain the differences in the results? Oh, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and I think I w I've been trying to comb through some of the results, and it's a little bit complex because the, um, the, the results of climate suitability not only depend on the, the habitat of the species, um, but also the change in climate and the, relative, the change relative to the um, region as a whole. Um, but I was trying to, in particular, think about the snake and why it um, why did it do better? Um, and I think part of that has to do with that it's a little bit of a generalist, but not too much. Um, and so uh, the, the, the regional average change in suitability um, was low. Let's see. So the, the linkages happen to be in places of greater suitability with, you know, in the landscape as a whole. Um, and so the places that we happen to choose um, or that the connectivity algorithms happen to choose were, um, were places where the suitability didn't change as much. Um, and so, uh, and I think that, yeah, I, I, um, I think also that the fact that the, um, the bear had uh, fewer longer linkages and, and, and a fewer number of habitat cores in general um, meant that it was more susceptible to changing climate. Um, but I, I honestly, um, there, I think the, the factors are kind of complex and, and um, kind of uh, difficult to, to pull apart. Um, but if you have any ideas, if anyone here has some ideas on that too, um, I'd be happy to hear them too. And uh, see, uh, I hope it's Ramana. I hope I got that right. Um, I'm not sure exactly if that was your question or if you just popped up. Um, I'm going to unmute you though. Uh, Ramana, you should have uh, you should be able to uh, speak over the line now. If you want to give us a shout out, if you have a question or if that was your question, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that was my question. I think a lot of it was maybe the habitat requirements of the different species and and how those were arranged on the landscape. But I didn't know if, you know, something about how they dispersed or um, would that one be included in the model? Yeah, they do differ in their dispersal. Um, but, and that was only, well, the home range was considered in the, with the habitat nodes 
um, but the dispersal itself explicitly wasn't um, here. Okay. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, go, oop, got another one. All right, let's see what it says. It looks like it's from Tara. Sorry, I can't exactly pull it up. Let me see if I can make this bigger. There we go. Uh, are there regulatory drivers to encourage conservation actions for these species in the southeast? For example, are they federally endangered species? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, they are on, let's see, they, the, the bat, let's see, I'm, I know that the, the um, bat is on some wildlife, state wildlife action plans, um, and the snake um, is on some too. The, the snake and the bear are relatively widespread, um, so I'm pretty sure they're not um, on any federal endangered species list. I'm not sure about the bat. Um, so yeah, so these are relatively, all relatively widespread in terms of their habitat use across the southeast with the, um, with the bat uh, being the most restricted. But, and they are, you know, species of, of some conservation concern, um, especially, especially the bat, um, but uh, if anyone has any more specifics on that, it's been a little while since I um, looked at all the state wildlife action plans, so I, f I don't recall um, which states or where, which ones um, have them on their lists. Um, but they were of concern to the um, landscape conservation cooperatives, um, or they are of concern um, in their habitat. The bottomland hardwood habitat is of concern also. Um, we do have a few other questions. Um, so in your example, why did the snake do relatively well in terms of a climate change threat? Yeah, and I kind of answered that um, before. I think it has to, kind of a complex answer, but um, I think it's because it's, it has to do with the fact that it's um, a relatively, um, a somewhat of a specialist that also uses um, a wide range of habitats, and so um, I think that it kind of covers a range of habitats that have varying degrees of of, of climate change or degrees degrees of expected climate change, um, and also degrees of expected um, urbanization, um, and so and so in the results, the more linkages were um, did did better than the other two. Um, the the bat is more restricted, and the bear is more generalist, but um, it includes um, its habitat includes some ag lands um, in places that are um, that are near uh, urban areas and would be expected to 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 be converted with urbanization. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, and um, what other stressors besides urbanization did you leave out, or which others would would have been good to add? Well, those, yeah, that's a really good question, especially in light of the recent hurricane. Um, we did not consider sea level rise, which um, you know directly on the coast or would be certainly a factor. Um, but more importantly than that, I think the um, potential for storms and storm surge and flooding in coastal areas um, would be very important to consider um, in this. And uh, especially for the bat and somewhat for the snake because they, those two species had a lot of linkages right along the coast um, that were important. Uh, there was a recent study, well, probably published last year or so, by Paul Leonard and others, um, who, which did take into account sea level rise. Um, so it'd be interesting to compare um, or to look at uh, the importance of sea level, sea level rise to connectivity in their study. But um, but that that was important in their study, and it would be interesting to to look at um, the the degree of of its impact. Um, they also used. Uh, 
the bear and the snake in their study, um, and I haven't compared between this study and their study. Uh, but it'd be interesting. They were looking at, um, they actually mapped co future connectivity, so rather than sticking with the same existing um, connectivity networks, they mapped changing in connectivity through time. Um, I guess another another stressor would be um, the potential for bioenergy uh, development in bottomland hardwood forests. Um, that's kind of a big, one big thing that folks talk about a lot, especially on the coastal plain, is harvest of bottomland hardwood forests for um, biomass for bioenergy. Um, so that would be important for these species since they use bottomland hardwood hardwood forests and we didn't take that to, into account. Um, I see a chat, uh, a question about ground truthing for the linkages. Um, I can answer that. Um, we have not done ground truthing for those linkages. Uh, uh, part of the study that I didn't mention, or that I mentioned but didn't go into, was this comparison of multiple um, algorithm, multiple connectivity algorithms and tools and data inputs. And so we haven't done ground truthing, but we have done um, a lot of work looking at um, multiple connectivity models and their overlap. So for, for each species, for each given species, we've used a range of um, connectivity tools um, and a range of input data, um, including uh, uh, movement measurements, um, observations, at least for the bear, and, and looked at the relative differences, and, it, and they do make differences, make a difference in the in the outputs, um, uh, you know. And so part of our work is to move toward a sort of ensemble of connectivity models, which I did not present here, um, but such an ensemble might might look at sort of the, the places where multiple models have predicted good connectivity. And so that's not ground truthing, but it's at least, you know, some measure of potentially um, maybe some confidence in the model connectivity. And it uh, looks like we got one more question sort of, uh, two, well, two questions that sort of touch on the same thing. Um, is this methodology applicable for aquatic ecosystems as well? And is, are you or anyone from climate centers doing this type of work for any aquatic species? Uh, the short answer is I don't know if anyone is doing it. Um, I, th I would think it would be applicable for sure. Uh, the, some of the specifics may change, um, but sort of thinking about climate threat and then the threat from other stressors is certainly relevant for aquatic species. Someone who's an aquatic um, expert uh, would have, certainly have ideas of what the in, how the inputs might change. Um, but certainly, broadly, I think this framework would be applicable for sure. Okay, uh, I think that addresses most of the questions that have come in. Thank you for your presentation, and uh, thank you for everyone who participated today. Uh, this was a really good webinar, and thank you very much. Thanks.